two prophets greeted one another and they said to each other, you're fine. How am I doing? <laughs> Good prophetic voices we need into our lives, amen? We need to assess how we are doing. Well, today I can ask you how are you doing, but uh, I think with the message today, we will see that what we need to be saying is to the Lord, Lord, you are great, how am I doing? And that's what I think we will draw from this message today. In the beginning of Revelation, uh, John is imprisoned on the island of Patmos. It's off the west uh, coast of Turkey. And uh, he's imprisoned there for the faith. And he writes to the churches in Western Asia. Turkey was called Asia, the Roman Empire at that time. And he's writing to seven of the churches there. The reason he's writing to there, he said he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and I love that phrase. John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. What is the Lord's Day today? Sunday. He, he was in the Spirit, and suddenly he heard a voice, and he turned around, and he had this fantastic vision. And Jesus was telling him things and revealing things. And he said, take in a book and write to the seven churches that are in Asia. And so he writes this letter to these churches in Asia, which is western Turkey. And he's off the, the coast of western Turkey. And I remember one time... Uh, my brother-in-law and his wife, they would travel around the world like twice a year. It was amazing. And so I saw Dick one time and I said, Dick, so where are you going next? He said, to Turkey. I go, Turkey? Why would you want to go to Turkey? And he said, well, you know, that's where the first uh, Christian churches were. And I go, oh, sure. Ephesus, Colossae, uh, 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 where there were Colossians. Um, Laodicea, Smyrna, Philadelphia, all those churches were there, the ruins of those churches, a very interesting trip that they had there. And uh, so they had a wonderful time seeing all that. So Jesus is writing to the seven churches. The last one is Laodicea. And this is where we're focusing today, what he says to the church of Laodicea. But the church just before that is Philadelphia. And it's interesting that um, in the letter to the Philadelphians, he basically commends them. He does not reprove them at all. Everything is good and he's blessing them. But then it comes to Laodicea and we kind of have the whole opposite of that. And he is really reproving the Laodiceans. So to Philadelphia, he did not reprove, but to Laodicea, he doesn't approve at all. And so when he begins the writing to the letters, he says to the angel of these different churches. And in the Bible, the word angel basically is just meaning messenger. And sometimes uh, the Bible is talking about a messenger it's using the word angel of a human, and sometimes it's an angel, angelic being from God. And we tell from the context if it's a, an angelic uh, being or a human. So we take it here that he's writing to the, to the angels of the different churches that this is the messenger of that church. This is the agent of that church. Probably that's the pastor of the church, the leader of the church. So he's writing the letter and he's sending it to the leaders of each church. And this is what he's saying about the churches and what they need to be doing. So Jesus is diagnosing them and speaking to their situation. So it's really a very interesting situation. So now when he comes to the church of Laodicea, he says, I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either hot or cold. 
But because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. That is really an amazing thing. Um, they were Christians. They were a church. But they weren't really on fire for the Lord. They weren't really greatly in love with the Lord. And uh, yet they weren't totally against the Lord. They weren't totally cut off. But it's interesting that Jesus' reaction to their faith is like, uh, it, it turns my stomach like that. I'm just going to spit you out of my mouth. So what a re remarkable statement. It would be better to be cold all the way or hot all the way, but to be in between is a really bad situation. Sometimes for Christians that have come to know the Lord, they say they're Christian, but they don't really love the Lord, they don't obey the Lord, they don't follow the Lord. That's a, a worse situation than if they never knew him. And you say, well, is that a little extreme? Wouldn't it be better to sort of know the Lord a little bit? But I don't think so, because Jesus expects us, when we understand about him, to be totally engaged, to follow him, to love him. For instance, in 2 Peter 2.20, it says this, if after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. And so that's quite an amazing statement, isn't it? Jesus says, if we're going to believe in him, we really need to decide. You know, it, it kind of recalls when Elijah had the test of Israel, where he called down fire on the mountain, and he told Israel, why are you halting between two decisions? If Baal is God, the corrupt, evil God, Baal, and you're going to follow him, then follow him. Or if the Lord be God, follow him. But why are you hanging out in between? You're vacillating between the two. And Jesus says, you know, make a choice. What are you? Are you my servant? Do you love me or not? I have found that the worst state people can be in is in an apathetic I don't care attitude. I have discovered that uh, in counseling, um, sometimes when people are really upset, they're closer to a breakthrough than if they're just laying back, oh, I don't care about anything, I don't care. Because what's happening, when a person is agitated with what challenges before them, they are throwing out their last, strongest defenses before they break. And I have seen in revivals where the people that are upset, they are the ones that will all of a sudden the next day they break and they say, I'm, I'm going to follow the Lord. And I, I've seen it numerous times. We've been through like three little revivals. In college, we had revival. And all of a sudden, we started having a lot of people really mad at us. And we hadn't done anything. So why are you mad at us? Well, you're causing problems. I go, okay. And uh, I go, more kids have been really coming to the Lord than ever before. There's signs and wonders and miracles that have been happening. But now you're upset with us? And then uh, I was a youth pastor with Lane after we were married for a summer. And we had fantastic things happen with the youth group in a short time. It tripled in size. And God was working with the youth wonderfully well. But then we had the adults complain. The adults were upset. And the temporary pastor that came in, he was upset and gave us all kinds of problems. And so, and then in Cherokee, where we, before we were here, we were called in to raise up a church to become self-supporting again. And we accomplished that. 
But we never had any problems until the church started getting full. Then people with their leathers and their beanies started coming in and, and I would have people come and say, Pastor, they're sitting in my seat. <laughs> we, we, so what I'm saying is, the worst situation people can be in is totally apathetic. Just not caring. But if things start happening, you can expect there's going to be problems. Things start heating up for the Lord because you're going to be, become a target for the devil. But I would rather see things being stirred up, people being upset, because there's a chance then they are fighting which way they're going to go. God is moving. God is touching people's lives. And I think it shows here too. Jesus was looking at this church and go, they're just blah. They're not hot. They're not cold. They're just blah. And that's the way I feel about it. Blah. <laughs> Isn't that an amazing statement? That Jesus would say that. Why would Jesus feel that way? You know, the book of Revelation starts off and it references that this letter is from Jesus and called, quote, the faithful and true witness. You know, Jesus was totally faithful to our cause, wasn't he? He went all through his years of ministry, being faithful to deliver the gospel. He even suffered death on the cross, being faithful all the way through for the joy of the salvation he was bringing to everyone. But he was called a true and faithful witness. And for people to see what he's done, and then just go, oh yeah, okay, yeah, no big deal. That upsets him. Last week I saw a documentary called Maggie's War. Maggie's War, I go, I gotta watch that, what's that about? <laughs> it was a true story of uh, James Magellis, they called him Maggie. He led a regiment of, of soldiers all through uh, World War II. He received all kinds of medals and awards. Because Maggie, he was 27 years old. And so many of his soldiers were like 18, 17 and 18, but he was 27. And he said, I just felt like I knew so much more than all these kids behind me. I had to lead the way. I had to lead it because I knew where the snares were. I knew where the mines were. I knew how to do things, and the ones behind me didn't know where all to go. So he always led from the front. The reason he led from the front is because he knew best what to do. So he was an amazing example. And he told his troops, none of us like being here. None of us like being in war. But we have a job to do. We have to fight it through. We have to be faithful. We have to stand, we have to fight, we have to attack. And usually they were attacking the, the Germans who were on the defensive. You, you are in a much more dangerous situation when you're attacking people that are in a defensive position, right? But one time, I thought God had to be with this guy and with his troops. And so often I've seen so many stories about World War II and you know at home the people were praying all the time, Lord bless, Lord help. And they never saw and they never uh, heard all the particular stories. But so many times, there's so many stories where you just go, God was certainly in that. And one time they attacked the Germans. They attacked a force of 270 Germans. And in attacking them, they killed 100 Germans and they took 170 prisoners. Completely won that battlefield. The remarkable thing is not one of the GIs was killed. Not one. How do you do that? You know? Here was an example of a true and faithful leader, right? And so to this day, they will get together and honor Maggie Magellis, James Magellis, Magellis, Magellis. Forget what it's called. Anyway, because he always led from the front. Jesus has always led us from the front. Jesus always has more experience and knows what to do more than the rest of us following, right? 
Um, none, is, none is like to go through the hard things of being a soldier for Christ. But we have a job to do. Whatever it takes, we have to be faithful. And we trust God is going to bless us, protect us, watch over us, and bless us in our lives. So Jesus continues talking to the Laodiceans about their church. I think one of the things we're uh, coming to is that um, they were pretty wishy-washy, and, and I think American churches for the most part are like this because over the last 70 years, we went from being a church nation to the goofiness we have going on now. And I blame that all on the churches who have always been afraid to speak up. Churches have never been in the public life. They never want to object to stupid, evil ideas because we've always thought, well, we don't want to look like we're being offensive. We don't want to look like we're being disagreeable. So the churches have always been quiet and out of public life. And we have not been zealous for the Lord. So I think this speaks to the American church. And I would say most American Christians, if you ask them how they are with the Lord, they say, oh yeah, I'm fine, I'm going to heaven, I, I know the Lord. But are they really? Are they really fine? Are they really going to heaven? So Jesus speaks to the church of Laodicea, verse 17, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered. Have, has the American church been rich and prospered? Absolutely. And I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Wow! What a difference of assessment, right? What a difference of assessment from what they think to what Jesus thought. A total flip-flop assessment from what Jesus thought and what they thought. What a surprise. Now, commentaries tell us that Laodicea was on a main Roman Empire trade route. And so they were very wealthy. They prospered. Laodicea was known for its banks. And it had a special manufacturing of a desired special black wool that was highly prized. And they had a medical school there that produced some special eye salve. So through all of that, they were very prosperous. And so the church in that community, they thought, hey, we're doing good. You know, we're Christians and uh, we are prospering. And, and so they thought they were good, but Jesus said, hey, the way I see you, you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I think we need to daily assess. We need to daily say, Lord Jesus, you're fine. How am I doing? How am I doing? In your eyes, under your estimation, what would you say to me? What do I need to know and to do? And how can I change? What do you want? Now, he said, um, you say that you are prosperous. You think you are prosperous. Now, prosperity is good. I believe in the prosperity teaching. You can't help but believe in it if you're biblical. Because in all the covenants, God promised that he would prosper. And the Bible said in 3 John, he says, I pray that you, that you prosper as your soul prospers and that you be in good health. God wants to be healthy. God wants our souls to prosper. And he wants us to be in prosperity. So it's awesome. I appreciate the prosperity movement because I was raised Baptist. And kind of the feeling was always, if you're going to be a good Christian, you're going to be poor. You're going to be struggling, you're going to be in bad health, and you're going to learn to praise God in spite of all the bad situation you find yourself in. But no, God wants us to prosper. 
But here's the thing, there's a balance, right? There's a balance in everything. And a few years ago, I saw a couple of uh, Chinese Christians through Skype talking to some American pastors. And the Chinese Christians said this. They said, you, you know, you in America, you have focused in on prosperity. And that's where your teachings and your theology has been developing. Here in China, our theology has been developing and focusing on suffering for Christ. In the Chinese church, the majority of Christians, true Christians, have spent time in jail. It, it, it is such the case that a Christian in China, if they have not been in jail for the faith, they ask the question, why does the Lord not consider me worthy to suffer for him? So obviously when I see there's a balance to all things, right? We cannot sacrifice our, our soul for wealth. There's an understanding, there's a balance of everything. But we, we need to have our souls prospering first and foremost. And God wants to bless in every way. We know some of the early Christians suffered persecution and the plundering of their property. But they knew they had an abiding home forever in heaven. They knew God would still provide for them. So it's a balance. But the Laodiceans, they were wealthy, they were comfortable, and so they assumed they were fine. But when Jesus looked at them and said, boy, you guys... You're not hot, you're not cold, you're just kind of blah. <laughs> how, how would you like the Lord Jesus to assess your faith and your life and say, yeah, you're kind of blah. I kind of feel like blah. Spitting you out. Doesn't that sound kind of uh, negative? Yeah, it really does, doesn't it? History tells us that the city of Laodicea suffered a terrible earthquake around just before 400 A.D. and the city was destroyed and never rebuilt. What happened to the church? Well, you, you can never tell for sure. At one point at Laodicea, they had a huge church council where leaders came together and met at Laodicea. And maybe the Christians were fine, maybe they continued being faithful and the city was destroyed. But it, it reminds me of other cities like uh, Capernaum, where Jesus did most of his ministry and miracles in the north side of Galilee. We were in Capernaum. But all it is today is it, just ruins. Ruins of the uh, synagogue. They know where Jesus stayed in that house. They know that was Peter's house. It's just the foundation ruins. But the city is gone. And all those cities where thousands of people dwelt when Jesus was ministering there, it, it, it's not there. And what a beautiful place to live. The north shore of Galilee is, is very pleasant. It comes up gradually into the land and be a wonderful place to live. But I remember Jesus saying something like, after he'd done all those miracles, there, remember he said, and you, Capernaum, and he mentioned the other cities, will you be exalted? Will you be glorified? No, you're going to be brought down. You didn't know the day of your visitation. You didn't really take it to heart. You didn't really respond, so you're not going to last. And so it's something for us to really take to heart. But now we can say, well, Jesus, is he just, is he just lowering the boom? Is he just being negative and judgmental? No, not really, because... If he believed they were a, a lost cause, he would, not con he would have not continued encouraging them and telling them what to do. But he believed they were still on the lampstands, they still were at church. So then he continues to talk to them. And he said in verse 18, So I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by the fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourselves, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, 
and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. What does that mean? We can think about that. How do you buy gold from Jesus? How do you obtain uh, white garments from the Lord so you, you won't be naked? And this is interesting. Did you catch this? And salve for your eyes so you can see. Did you pick up on that? Your city is known for producing eye salve, but that isn't really going to help you. You need to get from me salve for your eyes. Then he continues, verse 19, it's really encouraging, he says, those whom I love, I reprove. In other words, I love you. That's why I'm reproving you. When we are parents and we are chiding and disciplining our children, it isn't because we hate them, right? It's because we love them. We want them to proceed in life successfully and be solid and happy in life. So Jesus is saying, so I'm reproving you because I love you. So they would be wise to, to listen. So he's encouraging them. And then he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him or dine with him and he with me. I remember this is one of the ending verses in the four spiritual laws and the witness pamphlets. It comes down to the question, are you going to open up your heart to Jesus? Jesus is knocking on the door of our life. He says, if you hear my voice and you open the door of your heart, your life, I will come in and I will fellowship with him. In my mind, I, I, I relate to an instance where Lane and I have had, we were, we were talking this week one day about all of the key people in Christianity in this generation we've met. And, and the example I'm thinking of here is my hero in faith was T.L. Osborne. He wrote the book Healing the Sick. He and his wife, they say, saw more miracles than any person that's ever lived. They would have mass crusades, and hundreds of people would be healed. Thousands and thousands of people would come, and they constantly had healings all around the world, not so much in America, but in Africa, and South America, and Latin America. They would have thousands of people come in, so many miracles, more than even the Apostle Paul or uh, many of the other people in history. And I thought, wow, he's my hero. He, when, if you get that book, which I would encourage you to get, called uh, Healing the Sick by T.L. Osborne. He, it's the most inspiring book next to the Bible. And I got that and I read that and I go, wow, he writes so simply and directly. It makes so much sense, you know. And then uh, years ago, our church helped, we were a part of bringing T.L. Osborne to Des Moines. And he was here for like five nights down at the county auditorium. And a fantastic opportunity. But one day, we had a, a luncheon in a big room, all set up, it was all catered. And there's about 70 pastors there, pastors and wives. And T.L. Osborne came walking in, and he looked around, and he came and sat down right by me. And Lane and I were able to have lunch with T.L. Osborne. Wow. Amazing. Just, just amazing that we could visit, we could sit down and dine with him and visit with him for lunch. What, what an awesome opportunity. And then another time, we got to, when we lived in Harlan, Iowa, we had been reading the book that I would also encourage you to get and read. It's in the library, Like a Mighty Wind, a true story of the Indonesian revival. 
is it a missionary church? Is it a Presbyterian church of all types of <laughs> churches? They were praying for revival, and they had a Pentecost. And the flames started running on the roof. Fire department came because they thought the church was on fire. It was on fire, but spiritually. And they started sending out teams throughout Indonesia. And like they figure, what, I don't know, a few million people came to Christ in that fantastic revival. One of the key people in that church, his name was Mel Tari. And so we read that book. And it, it's such a sweet, wonderful book. The simple faith that people have. You know, we feel like we've got to be great big heroes of faith, right? But these people were simple believers, and Jesus just worked so powerfully with them. Anyway, before seminary, we had started a, a bookstore and a kind of coffee house type situation in Harlem, Iowa, called The Mustard Seed. We had about the seven of us couples leading and all that. And one day I got a call from uh, our, one of our couples, one of our friends. He was a pharmacist, and it was his wife called. I said, uh, Wally, Lady, come on, come on to the lake outside of town. Uh, we're going to have lunch with Mel Tari. What? <laughs> Who? Mel Tari? Yeah. And it turned out his parents lived in California, and they were wealthy, and they helped fund him to come over and travel across the United States. So we spent a couple of times together with him. So we went out to the lake. And, and we had fellowship and picnic together with Mel Tari. What, a, what an awesome thing. And then after lunch, we were talking and sharing. And he shared with us some of these new chorus songs that were coming out of the revival. And the one particular I remember, we all know now, but it was new then. Father, I adore you. Lay my life before you, how I love you. And there's Jesus, there's the Holy Spirit, and you see this around and everything, it's just awesome. But we've been, this is amazing. God, what are you doing? And, and then there's um, Josh McDowell. I had read his book, uh, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And uh, he goes around speaking all over the country, the college universities, about proof of the Bible, proof of Jesus. And when we decided we were going to seminary, I had backed a big truck up to our house. We built a new house. And, and I'd taken out a load or two. And it was night. It was in November. It was cold, dark night. And I just set something down. The and I turned around, and some guy jumps up at the back of the of the box in, in the truck. And he goes, hi, I'm Josh McDowell. And I said, Josh McDowell, what are you doing in my truck? <laughs> and that was where another friend, he had a little plane, and he was flying him around to different spots in the middle of the country. And so we got to visit with Josh McDowell for a little bit. And, and other, and, and, and other people, Benny Hinn, and uh, I, I figured some others. How exciting. But this is what Jesus is saying. If you hear my voice and let me in, I will fellowship with you. We will dine together. We'll have fellowship together. How exciting is that? To visit with a hero in our life, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray right now, you are our hero. You are the greatest person that's ever lived. Lord Jesus, we ask that you come to our church. You come to our lives in a very real way. And fellowship with us, walk with us, talk with us, dine with us. Jesus, come. Powerfully be with us. Jesus, yes. So that's the invitation he gave to the Laodiceans. Quite an invitation, right? You get a card in the mail. You are invited to the king's palace to have fellowship with the king. Yes. That's what he's doing. 
Then he says, the one who is faithful, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Isn't that neat? If we conquer, we remain faithful. We will come up and sit down with Jesus, who is also sitting on the Father's throne. We will be invited to fellowship with Him, rule and reign with Christ on the throne of heaven. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Then he says, at the end of the letter, and I think it's the end of all the letters, he says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What do you think the Spirit of God is saying to the American church? I think this letter fits perfectly well. What do you think the Spirit of the Lord is saying to you and me? Lord, what are you saying to me? We think you are fine. Lord, how are we? Lord, let us know. So the question for us is, how can we heat up our faith? Right? How can we be really alive in the faith, really alive in the love of Jesus? So just some thoughts. First of all, open the door of your life to Jesus. And say, Lord, I don't want to be a nanny band Christian. I don't want to be cool in my faith. Lord, I want to really know you as a person. And I know of people that have literally seen Jesus. We can say, Lord, I told my life is an open door to you. You need to challenge the Lord to say, Lord, I hear your voice. Come into my life. Fellowship with me. Walk with me. Make yourself known to me. Jesus said in John, if anyone loves me and keeps my commandments, him I will also love and manifest myself to him. The more we come in faith, the more we reality, the, the more of a reality it becomes with him. The more real he becomes to us. And then repent of being cold in the faith. Repent of not being alive in the faith like we should be, right? Lord, if you're going to take me to heaven for all of eternity, how important is that? Lord, make me to be totally alive, obedient, totally walking with you in the faith. And I'm sorry I've not been there. Help me to be there. And then Jesus tells us to buy his gold and his garments. Where, what store do you go to to buy that? What does that mean? I surmise it means things like this. The goal means get involved and know the things that are of real value. Faith, love, joy, keep your perspective on the right priorities. What is precious to the Lord, that is true possession, that's true wealth. And the garments, white garments, the Bible says crystal clear in Revelation, the white garments are the righteous deeds of the saints. Walk in righteousness. Help the poor. Do what is right. Stand up for justice. Stand up for the Lord. Walk in righteousness and you will be clothed in the, in the white, white garments of the Lord. The Bible also says, don't be weary in well-doing. This can be a danger for Christians that stand all their lives. You can say, oh, I'm tired of doing the same old, same old. I'm tired of going to church. I'm tired of always doing the right thing. But the Bible says, do not be weary in well-doing, and you will succeed. You will accomplish everything that needs to be done. And then the Bible says, we are not to live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I can testify to my own experience. If you are starting to feel dead inside in faith, immediately the question is, how much have you been getting your nourishment? 
You need to read the Bible daily. And it's so easy now. You pull out your phone, turn on the Bible, and listen. How lazy can you get? <laughs> but it's still valid. You can listen to the Bible. That's so easy. I get up. I don't know why, but I've just been waking up at 5.30 every morning. So I, I get up, come out to the living room, turn on the fireplace. It's neat. You got a little gas fireplace. It's awesome. Lay on the couch, and I pray, and then I just turn on the Bible. I just listen to the Bible. When you read the Bible, it does something to you. It's a spiritual event. It strengthens you. And like they say, if you go one week without nourishment, it makes one week. All right? And then, of course, pray. And I say, don't just pray. Meditate on the Lord. Listen to what the Lord is saying. What is the Lord saying to you? Start a conversation. Start a relationship. It gets exciting when you put your life into an active faith. That's when you start seeing things that truly be real. And finally, stay in fellowship. You know, one thing that the uh, pandemic has taught American Christians is church is really second rate. Church really isn't that important. We've learned that you can stay home and, yeah, that's easier than going to church. Church and fellowship are extremely important. I remember when we were in Caps Crusade for Christ, teaching witnessing and having that happen. They always concluded with a little illustration. They say, have you ever been out by uh, a campfire? And you take one log out of the fire and you pull it out to the coal and lay it by itself, what happens? The flames dwindle down, it goes to coal, to um, coals, yeah, burning coals, and then it just, it just goes out. We need to keep hot and fired up for the Lord by being together. So do, do not neglect fellowship. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this letter to us. It is as much to us as it was to the Laodiceans. Father, make us alive in you, and Jesus, you be alive with us. Indeed, Lord, we choose to do all these things. We choose indeed to open the door of our lives. And so, Lord, again, we say, Lord, we open the door of our lives, of our church, and say, Lord, here we are. Come and dine with us, fellowship with us, talk with us. Make yourself known to us. Lead us, direct us, fill us with your spirit, and help us to walk in your will. Bless, Lord, help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If there's anyone who doesn't know the Lord, you need to know that knowing the Lord is the greatest treasure you can ever have in your life. We seek the Lord Jesus because He is the Son of God. He is the life giver. He's died for our sins. So all we have to do is say, Lord Jesus, I believe in You. I believe You died for my sins. I believe You were raised from the dead. I believe You are seated with God the Father in the heavenlies. I believe that when I die, I will never die. I will go on. I will be raised up. I will live with you in heaven. If I receive you into my heart, if I believe on you, and I do that now, I believe on you. I receive you into my heart and my life. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. And if there's anyone who's just accepted the Lord, please let us know. Please contact us. We will send you a gift a disciple book to give you more understanding, to give you more faith. Or write us an email. Thank you.